Okay, so in this episode, we're going to talk through uh, monitoring team sites uh, and monitoring site pages and how that will have an impact on your strategy. Uh, actually, what we're looking at now is just a legacy site. I mean, it's pretty much similar to what you're accustomed to or used to in SharePoint 2013 if you're migrating from there. Um, actually, you will see that... Um, you know, the documents library uh, has a modern uh, UI. We're going to talk about that in a future episode. Uh, but, you know, as far as like all the other capabilities, if you go to site contents, uh, this, is ha this has a different UI. It's a little bit different. But here you can come up to the top where it has the new plus sign and actually add in a list or document library or even a page from here. Um, the app is pretty much just going to give you uh, a list of all of the out-of-the-box uh, legacy uh, like libraries and lists or any custom apps that you're pulling from the SharePoint store or if you're pulling from the app catalog because your your organization is developing custom apps. Uh, that's where you, know, you will pull in those apps. So if you go back to that new button, and if you look at a list, this is just going to build you out a uh, custom list, a very standard list uh, without any um, out-of-the-box template or list template. And this is going to build you uh, very similar for a document library, just your standard document library, uh, but not any of the out-of-the-box template like picture library or uh, you know, asset library, any of those uh, type of libraries. Um, any of those other custom libraries, as I mentioned before, will be under apps. Um, you will also notice that um, in this new site content page with the um, modern UI, uh, you're going to have like analytics for the site. And this is going to track like how many visitors you have to the site, what are the popular documents. And then also it's going to give you this uh, tips window. Uh, and I think the tips window would be very handy as they're rolling out new features and new capabilities. Uh, hopefully they will leverage this tips window to help communicate those features and capabilities. If you scroll down to content, this is where you're going to find your mix of document libraries and lists. And then if you go under subsites, this is where you're going to have all of the subsites that live underneath this site here. And in order to create a site, you just go to new and then hit the last option, which is subsite. And then uh, you will have the ability to create a subsite given the out of the box templates, uh, site templates, and you can select and choose these uh, very similar to what you have in 2013. So in that regard, there's really not many changes to the legacy site um, uh, part of the um, as far as O365, so as you migrate these sites in, uh, here's the site settings page. Uh, you can see some of the options are very, very similar to what you're used to. Now, one thing to, to watch out, though, Microsoft in the background is starting to trim uh, the site settings page, especially uh, new sites compared to created sites like if they want to like remove like the um, the gallery or the solutions gallery or the uh, template gallery as you can see those options are not here under site settings uh, so that's just one of those things I mean that's that new world order that you're kind of working with working within when you are in O365 um, on the surface it seems like there's a lot of similarities but as you kind of dig deep you will notice that uh, there are some differences uh, when it comes to the legacy sites right now this is going to be pretty much standard. like as you migrate like whatever tool that you're using to migrate from 07 2010 or 2013 either it be ShareGate or content matrix or any of the other third-party components um, as you migrate these in this is what your site um, should look like uh, populated with data uh, you're going to run into some issues with, uh, as I mentioned before in the intro, like if you're heavily, heavily customized, are you going to have issues there? If you have uh, custom web parts that are DLL and WSP, uh, obviously those will have to be refactored into either the new SharePoint development framework model or the add-in model. But outside of that, as far as like your core data, uh, that information should migrate over um, as such. Now, here's the big differences. So now let's get into some of the uh, modern team sites. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually come up here and hit SharePoint. This is going to take me to the SharePoint home. We're going to go into a lot of details about this page and a lot of the features and capabilities about this page. But as of right now, uh, I'm going to just use this page to go to this existing group site. And these are called O365 group sites. Now, O365 group sites, even though if you try to dissect the name, uh, it says O365, then you say group, and most of the time they're referred to as O365 groups. Um, those represent sites or a group of people that are coming together to collaborate. Now, they just recently, they as in Microsoft, just recently added in uh, the, a modern team site capability to these O365 groups, and this is what we're looking at now. Whereas before, 
before some of this new capabilities. And this is new. I mean, uh, the date of this uh, video is um, mid-November, right, 2016. So this is new as of, I want to say, six weeks ago, four weeks ago maybe. Um, and this is only in first release. I don't even think this is in production yet. So this is like a pre-release tenant to where I am able to see. And you can do this too as well. And we're going to kind of talk about this when we get into, uh, I believe, season two or season three, where we talk about, you know, how do you – uh, how many how many tenants you want to you come out the gate with you know what's the right number of tenants based on your organization and where you guys want to go versus where you are now but um so this is first release so this is going to give me a sneak peek of all the new features and capabilities so i can kind of play around with them uh but the o365 groups initially kind of looks something similar to this page here i think there's a lot of more capabilities and features but initially when this was rolled out it was tied into outlook Right, not really having a SharePoint component other than the fact that that's where you want to store your files. But if you look at the calendar, uh, this is going to be an Outlook calendar. So this is going to overlay, right? You can bring this in like any other Outlook calendar. And I think from a team perspective, it was very, very useful because then you can kind of overlay your personal calendar with the group calendar or any other groups or distribution groups, right, that you are related to just to kind of make sure that, you know, you, you had your schedule. Uh, fully accounted for. Uh, so it's a cool thing that the group itself actually received an Outlook calendar versus a SharePoint calendar that was, you know, driven by a SharePoint list. Uh, another another major difference between, between these O365 groups is that um, the conversations are, are treated somewhat like an Outlook inbox. Uh, and the group itself is actually given a email address, almost like very similar to like a, the Outlook or Exchange distribution concept. So you can send an email to the group Group, and then everyone that's part of that group will have access to that box and access to those emails, which was very, very uh, cool in a sense that uh, if you add it, say, for example, we fire up the group that was talking about a uh, redesign of a uh, new uh, Tesla, right? And then we start to hire in consultants and to bring in our team like six months down the road or eight months down the road. They have access to all that past conversation. So, you know, the knowledge transfer becomes, hey, go to that group site, get up to speed with all those emails. And maybe you highlight the emails or you tag the important emails that everyone should know. And then also like the different information that I uh, access and um, I'm sorry, the information discussions and you know, all this other deep dive, they would have access to those type of communication, which made them very, very uh, appealing to uh, those, that type of collaboration, right? Because it was, hey, here's the historics, get up to speed by reviewing all the documentation that's there, and now let's go ahead and meet in our private session for a KT and knowledge transfer. Um, the notebook is just a OneNote file that's tied to the group. Very handy, like if you guys are having meetings, someone's scribing all the information is there. You don't have to worry about distributing the notes. You don't have to worry about mixing that group notes, that committee's notes, or that you know technical Tesla design type notes with your other day-to-day -day stuff that you may be working with on other projects and that. So you know having that separation baked in part of the team site, part of the uh, the group site itself uh, only made sense. Um, so that those were some of the capabilities there. Now, as of as of recent, uh, they added in uh, a connector to uh, Planner. So now you have, you know, the capability to go out there, you know, as a group, if you, there are certain milestones you want to plan for, or this is where you want to uh, probably initially start with a brainstorming session and then, you know, put all those like in the backlog and then start to build out you know, roadmaps or boards in order to start tackling these high priority items and breaking them down into tasks and assigning those tasks to various members of the groups. Again, starting to bleed into that feature capability that traditionally we would fire up a project site for and kind of manage all that there. Uh, this kind of really taking you from soup to nuts um, down that pro down that path. Um, I, I don't honestly, I don't know a lot of detail about the planner uh, feature. I mean, I, I believe planner was just released probably three or four months ago. I really haven't had a chance to really do a deep dive, but from based on the white papers and the information that I've seen, this is how uh, people plan to use it. Uh, <laughs> no pun intended, but um, you know, but as you kind of navigate to that planner, um, as you can see. Uh, it is, it is direct link to the notebooks and then direct link to your Outlook calendar, all the members of the team and all this other good stuff. So I, I think the O365 group as a whole is that one feature in O365 that really kind of ties and pulls into many different as aspects of O365 into a single feature. And I think uh, as of today, even with the Microsoft Teams, the one that was just released like a couple of weeks ago, even with the Microsoft new Teams feature, I still believe that 
O365 is the one that kind of brings it all together, right? They say, hey, you got these components. If you're in the Exchange Outlook world, this is where 90% of your work is. Or if you're in the SharePoint, OneDrive, you know, team, project, that type of world, SharePoint is where you do 90% of your work. But I think with the O365 groups, it's kind of bringing in, you know, all of those uh, different components in there uh, collectively, So, which is uh, very interesting. Um, another key thing to, to note, let's actually navigate over to the site section. Now, this files, this is interesting. What's what's happening here with the files is that, you know, this feels like a document library, actually, because it is. Um, they just call this out, and I think part of that is just being backwards compatible because before o 3 file groups integrated with the modern team sites, um, files was the only, I think, that was the only component that was tied to SharePoint, right, per se, you know, SharePoint proper. Uh, and, that, and basically what it was is that it would fire up another site collection that was kind of hidden, uh, and then it would give you a document library. Then in that document library, that's where all the users, uh, all the members of that group kind of store their information. But they did not have, like, the pages, the site contents, or, you know, the gear icon to go and create other lists or libraries or uh, or things along those lines within that site. Uh, so that's where, you know, they didn't have the full feature and the capability of the team site, but just that document library. And then, like, as I mentioned before, it wasn't until just recent that they actually started to integrate with uh, the modern team sites. Uh, when you create a group, you have two options. Um, you can, uh, let me see if I can create one for us to take a look at. Uh, let me go over here to... Um, I think uh, I need to get back to Outlook. So let's go to Mail. All right, so here's my group section here. Uh, here I can click on Create. And then as you kind of go through, and I'm not going to go through all the details here, uh, it selects a name. Now, this name is going to be validated against any site collection. And Oh, yeah, and that's another thing. This The group sites actually do create a site collection, right, versus a subsite. And with, when we talk about the new modern team sites, uh, th they too will create a site collection. So I think that's a major change, especially from an architecture planning perspective, that you kind of have to wrap your hand around, head around, and you have to actually make sure that you account for from a, a, a topology uh, standpoint or information or, uh, standpoint, right? Because now you can't depend on having shared master pages you can't depend on having uh, a suite of content types at the top and then those being trickled down without using the content type hub for example right so i think your you know your, your strategy is going to shift a little bit understanding that you know from a self-service the out-of-the-box self-service without any customization uh, as of right now those are going to create legacy team sites but in the future, in the near future, probably by the time that you guys migrate out to O365, they're going to be creating site collections with the new modern sites. And those new modern sites will include an O365 group, which will, you know, kind of change the way that the security model is, is, is changed a little bit. And we, we'll touch on that. So this uh, name availability is going to val validate against all the site collections that you have out there, just to make sure you're not duplicating the name of another site collection that's not even a group that's just in your tenant. So it's going to validate against that. And uh, then here uh, you give a brief description. Uh, and then you're able to f select a privacy setting. So basically, the way that this works, you have gr uh, group owners, group members, and then you have visitors. Uh, this privacy setting is going to say who are your visitors, right? Who can, you know, if it's public, that means everyone's going to have read access. They can find these uh, group sites. They can discover and they can jump in and see what you guys are working on. Uh, that's going to make it, that's public. Uh, and then, or you can select private, meaning that they have no clue that this guy exists, and only until you invite them in as members or owners will they actually have access uh, to this group site. Now, here's another thing. Um, here's another thing. Um, actually, subscribe new members so they receive group conversations. I have no idea what that does, actually. Interesting. Um, Here's another uh, with security, right? So when O365 members, owners, uh, those are going to be treated uh, like uh, like site owners, uh, comparable in, sh in SharePoint, right? Um, or, or because this is a site collection, they're going to be treated as site collection admins where they have full control over the site. They can go into the gear icon. They can see, you know, who's access to the site collection admin group. They can see, uh, they can turn on features, you know, at the site collection level as well as the site level. So all the privileges that you have and the way you understand site collection admins of having those where 
member owners have all right so that's the type of access member owners are going to have now when you look at look at site members uh, those are going to be uh, very similar to the SharePoint contributor groups uh, to where you know they only have you know editing access to you know certain things like adding items to a document library or creating columns on document library or adding lists and things along those lines uh, so you know wh wherever you know their permission level defined as uh, for site owners that's in site collection admins that's what the member owners will have standard members will fall into that SharePoint visitors group and then what you select here from a privacy setting will determine um, if everyone or not everyone this is an all or nothing will have at least read access to this group okay so we can go ahead and create that there and as of right now that's being created right here in Outlook and then now it's asking me you know how do I want to manage my members um, and here I can add obviously myself is going to be added here I don't believe there's anyone else. Yeah, so I'm already here. So I'm at myself here, and by default, you're already, you're already, you know I'm already added as a creator of that group. Uh, now, if uh, another cool feature that that was just added recently was the ability to add in visitors, and when you add in a visitor, uh, this is where you add a, a user who was outside of your organization. So I can just use a public email address. Uh, like clardo11 at yahoo.com as add them in as a guest and then that user will be given uh, I believe con uh, visitor access to um, to this group site and, and they will have the same capabilities of you know modifying the, uh, the site that you know contributors will have uh, traditional tr contributors will have uh, to that um, to that SharePoint site okay so that's groups so now let's go back to site and this is going to drop us into the the modern site and what you're looking at now uh, and, and this is where things get a little bit confusing and we're I'm still not 100% on where Microsoft is going with this only because we don't have the full picture yet so w when we look at this let me just bring up notepad just so that because I'm a very visual person and this is how I learn so just kind of see it so so basically uh, you're gonna you have modern sites right are, are aka modern team sites let's just put those in there right so you're going to have modern team sites you're going to have modern publishing sites and this is uh, to be uh, to be released to br and then you're going to have modern uh, now now here's the confusing I don't, I'm not sure o three c two five group sites and modern team sites are going to be one and the same right but as of today, we're only dealing with uh, O3C5 group sites that have a site option, right? And then when these modern team sites come come out, when they're fully released, like the, I, I think um, we're expecting these very soon. We're expecting these by the end of uh, 2016, actually. We heard, we, uh, Microsoft has confirmed that the modern team sites will come with a O3C5 group uh, feature. So every modern site that you create will have come with O365 uh, group feature. Uh, can you turn those on or off? We have no idea. And what we have now is this guy here, which it says anytime that you create an O365 group site, O365 group site, uh, you're going to have a modern site option that's tied to that. And they took all the existing ones and they appended uh, this new feature to those uh, when you know the modern team sites who are O3 C D five group sites were connected to modern team sites and when Planner was integrated with O3 C D five, they also added another link or integration with O3 C D five to where each O3 D five group site, even if it was existed or if it's created brand new, were integrated with uh Planner. Now we also have this and this is what I'm gonna show you now. No, actually we're gonna get to this real soon. We also have modern site pages. Right, and then all of this is kind of grouped with the modern UI versus the legacy UI, and, and we kind of touch on that now. So what we're looking at now, this is the old 365 group site tied into a modern team site, right? And uh, with the and, and this site here uh, is using the modern UI, and with the modern UI, this is going to be uh, heavily, heavily JavaScript related, right? And this is something that I talked about in my preview. Um, it's heavily JavaScript related. It's not necessary. It's not what we're used to SharePoint developers. What we're used to when we talk about you know like .NET components and then different components brought in using the master page or the page layout or the site pages within SharePoint. And you know you had all those .NET controls that define like navigation and all this other good stuff. So all this is going to be Java, Java, JavaScript uh, related. And I think React or 
leveraging the React framework. So Microsoft is getting away from that proprietary, hey, let's build out our own SharePoint JavaScript library, or our own, you know, .NET controls just for SharePoint. They went more of an industry standard. Of course, there's a layer on top of that that's going to be SharePoint related. Like, you know, there's a lot of SharePoint common functions as far as, you know, click events and, you know, how to get users, how to get members, how to get libraries and all that other good stuff. That's still going to be common that integrates with the out of the box REST API or a custom REST API, whatever the case may be. But it's not going to be proprietary, you know, JavaScript, right? They're not going to say, hey, we're not using jQuery. We're going to build our own jQuery framework. They kind of moving away from that, which is a good thing. It's, it's definitely a, a, a good thing. So, uh, so with that, this guy is, this monitoring UI is going to be more responsive. Right. So, you know, when we say responsive, we're looking at the horizontal scroll bar just to make sure this fits nice. If we were viewing this page within the mobile phone in vertical orientation, this is how it would look. It would actually be a little bit wider. And as you can see, I can condense this guy all the way down without even getting a um, horizontal scroll bar. Now, you will notice that as I collapse out certain features like icons and images and stuff like that certain capabilities the left navigation all this other good stuff starts to reappear the more real estate i have it so you know just say for example if this is and i don't know this to be exact but tablet and horizontal view for example this is what this screen will look like mobile friendly compared to the legacy stuff right when you start to squeeze uh, i know we got the legacy i think this one of the first one so uh let's try team deshawn so this is like your 2013, right? And you can see even this view immediately, I'm getting a horizontal scroll bar. And as I squeeze in, you don't see my left navigation disappearing. Actually, you don't see any of this stuff collapsing and readjusting based on my real estate. So this is not responsive. So in the, you know, back in the day, back in the day, like six months ago, uh, when we were working on 2013 on-prem or 2010 on-prem or 07 on-prem, if you wanted this thing to be mobile friendly because mobile devices are starting to bleed into your organization, there was a custom master page that you had to go off and build for this, or there was a custom UI that you had to go off and build for this. And most of that customization is going to go away because out of the box, Microsoft is making this um, mobile friendly and, and uh, uh, responsive so uh so with that so that's not the only thing that you're going to get with these modern ui right so if i go into edit mode it, the, you will see here uh in a second that the publishing story for this is a lot uh a lot intuitive and a lot simple i'm not sure what that delay was but a actually as i mouse over you see this plus sign i'm giving this plus sign and now i can add in a document li i mean a library i'm sorry a web part and this is going to be the images web part. So I can come up here and then add in like this logo right off my desktop, hit add image, and then I'm good to go. I wasn't prompted for, hey, which library do you want to put this in? Oh, you want to upload from it from your, your desktop? Okay, upload the image from your desktop. Choose which library you want to drop it in. And then from that library, select the image in order to put it into the page. They really condensed that story. Now, this is absolutely, you know, obviously stored in a document library or a picture library, full asset library behind the scenes. But from a user perspective, I didn't have to make that decision up front, right? And then when I go back into there, say, for example, if I hit this images web part again, it's going to show me all the recent uh, web parts. And then obviously I can go to sites and then go to um, site assets and then get lost and not be able to find anything. Interesting. I see the logo of my site, but simple article. Okay. So hold on to those images because once you upload them, they're going to be lost. No, this is this is interesting. All right, so change. Why did, how come that didn't store in my recent? Anyway, I can look at the URL and figure out where this thing is being stored. All right, so anyway, so I can kill this, right? But, but either way, I mean, the story, and there and there's other... Um, modern web parts. So let's talk about these web parts a little bit because I think this is what's going to really help uh, help us wrap our head around you know the modern design, the modern way of doing things. Right? It's more than the modern design. It's really just new feature, new capability, new framework, new you know new DNA uh, actually uh, the way that they're kind of putting these sites together now. Uh, so here's the modern uh, web parts, and as you can see, there is no list view web part. There is no app to add in. Uh, so you know, so we're disconnected. This is a different set of web parts than what we're used to in this guy here, right? So if I go to 
uh, Team Deshaun. And if I go to edit, you know, very similar if I was going to do in 2010, 2013, or even 07, I can go insert here and then click on web parts. I'm still in 0365. Um, I'll still get the ribbon and I still have the light and I'm gonna start calling these legacy right these are the legacy web parts uh, that we are accustomed to especially with out of the box and if we were customizing web parts with WSPs those guys will pop up here uh, as well as you know any add-ins or anything like that add-in part or whatever funky name they want to give it now that would be available here uh, and then you can come in and just add those in as normal but, you know, with this new modern UI, this is a different suite, right? Uh, now, they did say they, as in Microsoft, if you look at under development, you will see news headlines, new list. This is the new modern web parts. Um, and then I, I believe there was another section called, oh, it's not custom. It's Deshaun's world. That's me playing around. But they did have another section. I can't find it now. That's the thing, like they're forever moving things around in here. Um, I can't find it now. But there was another section uh, that they were calling, was it under development? But anyway, it had all of the modern UI web parts that you can add in. Um, and I'm not sure if this is going to break or not. Oh, yeah, this is going to break. But I think this is breaking only because, again, this is my first release tenant. I'm on the bleeding edge with receiving new features and capabilities. And I know for certain just because with me playing around with uh, the new modern web parts in the SharePoint development framework, there is a special site collection, right, the developer site collection that you need to be in in order to interact with the modern web parts into the legacy sites. Right. So so that's what they're doing. So they, they're saying, yeah, go out there and use the SharePoint development framework. And all of these are built with the SharePoint development framework by Microsoft. And there's a whole nother suite of web parts that are available on GitHub that the community is working with. So, I mean, you're really starting to, especially because it's new tech, it's a new framework. You, they're really burning this candle from really three different ends. So you got Microsoft adding web parts you got the community adding modern web parts and then your organization themselves which your development team uh, they will be adding web parts you know related to whatever custom solution or business requirements that you guys are trying to solve with the new modern web parts so you know all of that is going to play uh, very very nice and you can kind of add those in I'm not going to use this video to actually go through each one of these guys but I really just want to highlight this as hey there's a new subset there's a new world order that's coming with modern design this modern technology and even with now these modern web parts that are only built using the SharePoint development framework and not the add-in model or the app part model or the app model that we were kind of growing into when we were leaving full trusted code with WSP and all this other good stuff. And I think that's the evolution, right? So again, just because I'm a visual person, we started out with WSP solutions, which entailed web parts, feature event receivers, event receivers, um, list definitions, content type definitions, blah, 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 blah. So that was the, and those how packaged it up as WSP, and this was called full trusted code, right? And the reason why it's called a full trusted code because you were referencing, or you as a developer were referencing the uh, SharePoint DLL that lived on the SharePoint server. And this code will only be able to execute if it lived on the SharePoint server. And all kind of issues ran into that, right? One, it knocked you out of the upgrade path, not because it lived on the SharePoint server, but because everything you were customizing did not be part of the content database. And every time there was an upgrade, your DLLs or your custom DLLs had to reference the new version of that DLL that that was relative or respective to that new version of SharePoint. Technically, blah. All right. So that was WSP. Then Microsoft came back and said, hey, we're going to do this new app model thing. Right. And this was mostly saying that, you know, we need to do this app model. And that's because we, we need you guys to be cloud friendly. And cloud, you know, this was cloud friendly because all of this app model code ran on a separate server and was brought in via JavaScript or some other type of scripting uh, capability. Oh, yeah. And in between that, you had sandbox solutions. Right. And this was, again, DLLs that were ran on the SharePoint farm 
but they try to wall it off in a in a controlled environment that says, hey, you know, you only allocated this much RAM, you only allocated this much CPU. So if you you know wrote something, wrote something that was, hey, let's iterate through all these subsites within the site collection, and there's 5,000 of them. But at the time that I wrote this code, it was only 50. And for whatever reason, I did not foresee that that 50 can easily exponentially grow into 5,000 and then eat up all the server and the CPU and really bring the entire SharePoint farm to its knees. Um, they wanted to control that with sandboxing, uh, those type of solutions. And I think sandbox, were, you know, kind of took on, took off, uh, but they were very limited because you were confined within that site collection. And certain things you wanted to do outside of the site collection didn't work and became a pain in the butt. And over time, and, and over time, it was just easier to um, to write full trusted code just because you never knew when you know, the scope of that custom functionality would grow beyond that site collection, and you needed to interact with other data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was Sandbox. Uh, that was a flop. Uh, then they went to the app model because they were trying to get everything cloud ready, right? But the problem with with this approach was that when they tried to go cloud ready uh, with the app model. Uh, they uh, pretty much took their server-side uh, install and then just pushed that out to the cloud and then just kind of, you know, you know, did whatever they need to do to make it, you know, to where they can support multiple tenants uh, within, you know, the same databases and all this other good stuff. Um, but, I, I, but I think, you know, from a development standpoint, a, a lot of people kind of struggle with this. This was kind of inefficient in a sense uh, because the way it worked was that you would have a set of code on this remote server. And then that, you know, so, you know, you would have someone call into your SharePoint uh, page, call your code on that remote server. That remote server would make a call, uh, a service call into SharePoint, ask for some data. The data will go back to that remote server. And from that remote server, they would, go, they would feed back to uh, the client. So there was kind of like a round, a round, round robin type a conversation um, be between uh, the two and then also uh, security became a, a pain in the butt but you know and this is still true right this is still true but it's, it's somewhat disconnected and then I think the, the worst thing that this thing brought to the game was the iframe uh, so if you wanted to do an add-in part or whatever uh, as a web part you would bring it in but it would not be responsive so this was cloud ready but it was not mobile ready and I think that's the issue that they ran into uh, with that model. So now we're down to the SharePoint development framework, um, short code as SPFX. Um, and this is the one that's uh, very similar to the app model, right? You still kind of have this round robin. And that's why, you know, even if you're not moving to the cloud, I would highly recommend trying to code or getting used to coding uh, with the add in model or even better uh, case do JavaScript within your pages and then call um, custom REST API services um, that use the CSOM and all this other good stuff. Um, you're still going to get this round robin, but developing under that strategy and under that service-oriented architecture and knowing when you can cache, how to cache, how to do your OAuth security, how to get all that plumbing together, understanding that is just going to make your life so much easier here. Right. Um, and even though like this, you know, this round that CSOM piece is probably only 30 percent and the other 70 percent, hopefully you can use like out of the box uh, REST API, either out of the box SharePoint API or the Graph API or, you know, either some of the other APIs that they're coming up with as they roll out new products. Um, if you can get away with API only out of the box APIs you're good to go. That's going to be your 70%. The other 30% is when you need to do something funky for your organization because it's a multi-step process, yada, yada, yada. Um, that's going to be the 30%. And then that's when you're going to find yourself doing the CSUM code and then um, custom REST API and all this other good stuff. So that's where that's kind of like the evolution of where we're going with that. Uh, what we're looking at here now, this is just the news web part uh, that was... Um, recently uh created and you know and they're doing something very fancy with this and we're not going to go into every detail but that's i think that's just the news headline wet part you can bring that in they also have the news listing which kind of lists this out into uh vertical view and then within this wet part itself you can actually come in here and start adding in uh different um different um different news articles now the one thing and then if you click on this pencil here it brings up the web part property associated to that web part 
uh, in some wet parts we're having some will not and uh, the news headline is, seems to be one without one um, the image web part seems to have one but it's very simplistic meaning that you can just add in an alt text and I'll just add that there right um, what else so so outside of this this is you know it's pretty it's pretty basic right uh, if you're used to customizing uh, publishing pages or page layouts, you're used to having uh, control over the grid system. Uh, the grid system as in, you know, uh, the wet part zones that you can drop wet parts in, and they're growing into that, right? Uh, Microsoft is growing into that. Right now, there's only one column, one set of zones, and basically you're just stacking wet parts within that zone uh, in a vertical uh, f fashion. Uh, this uh, horizontal layout here, or this two-column layout here, is done within this uh, within this wet part itself. That's not because you know it's not from the zones on the page or the page layout. So that's something that uh, we're growing into, and hopefully we I believe we we're expected to see that Q1 or the top of uh, 2017. Um, and here's the other cool thing about it. So as you kind of drop these wet parts in. Uh, really depending on the, the type of functionality that you're using, the UI framework that you're using behind it. Uh, for the most part, these are going to be responsive. But it seems like the more I squeeze in here, something is keeping this thing from being responsive. And I think it's this image here, which is interesting because I, I, would, I would have expected that the image web part would have made these images responsive. Uh, out of the box, but it seems like this image here is not playing nice. Um, so that's interesting. So anyway, uh, what else? Um, so if you go to the gear icon, you go to site settings. Uh, this guy here, you will notice that there is no permission group. There is no permission level uh, management here. Uh, those options are removed because this is an O365 group and in the O365 group uh, those are managed uh, using AD groups. I don't know if I mentioned that or not but you know uh, every time you create an O365 group uh, in the background what it's doing is creating an AD group and it creates um, owners of that. Of, I don't know if it's two AD groups or if it's one AD group uh, but I believe it's owners of the AD group and then there's members of the AD group and then the visitors are not part of that group because I believe that um, that was a privacy setting if it was private or public uh, the privacy setting um, I don't believe those users are dropped into the group so but but that's how that's managed so they do not use um, on the surface it doesn't seem like they're using SharePoint groups but I I learned uh, a few weeks ago that actually in the background they are using uh, SharePoint groups they're just not displaying them because they don't want you managing those groups from this interface okay all right, so now let's go into modern pages. So let's go back to our uh, test to Sean. And again, th this is what your typical legacy site is going to look like. This is actually what your typical migrated site is going to look like. And now the capabilities are going to be, okay, well, you know, we built years of information on this legacy track, right? And now we migrated this to O365. We understand that there's this modern UI track or this modern uh technology track that's happening in the background how can we take advantage of that do we have to migrate all of this data to like an O365 group site or a modern team site the answer is actually yes and no typical answer in SharePoint yes in the sense that you can take full advantage of it by using your existing site because now what they have done and you may not see this in production O365 because this is again first release first release uh, if you go add a page this is going to add in a modern site page, right? And this is going to fill, um, test the Sean again, and then I hit the plus sign, and then let's go ahead and bring, it, bring in my news headline, and let's go ahead and add some news. Um, wait, what did I do here? News headline. Oh, okay. Wait, I, I just have to make sure I'm saving this stuff. So I can do a save and close. Oh. Interesting. What's going on here? Oh, you know what? You know what? What's going on here? <sighs> you know what? Hold on. Let me um let me kill this. 
I think I have, I think I was in the middle of something. Let me close all, and here's another thing, like when you're in 0365, this thing opens up all type of uh, tabs. Oh, great. I didn't mean to kill the entire thing. Okay, so let's go 0365. Uh, okay, where are we? Nope. Yeah, this is right. Uh, oh, let me just type in there. All right. <clears throat> Let's see if we can get back in here. Okay, so um, if I go to, hold on, let me go back here. Now, if I go to the gear icon here, add a page. See if this lets me do it. Type in some gibberish, add in the wet part. Okay, save this. Okay, cool. So I did it. So uh, I think I was in the middle of editing this same page with different wet parts, and it kind of somehow blew up. I'm going to call it that, right? So anyway, so now I can go in here into uh, the shine, right? What's this cap box on? Come on. All right. So now we have this guy here, and I can go down here and add in, like if I want to bring that image back in with the car. Um, interesting. So recent is relative to the site that you're in, which makes sense. It would be fun if it will follow me and not be relevant to the site, but anyway. So if I go upload, bring in the car, right, hit add image. So this guy is there now. Hit save and close. All right, and then hit publish. So now I can bring in this modern UI within the legacy site. So if I go home, uh, this is like a legacy standard uh, site. And then if I go actually back on the browser, I can bring this guy in with the, the new modern site page. Right. So so this is not a modern site uh, from a DNA perspective. Right. This is just a legacy team site. And from a technical standpoint, this is created with the uh, site template ID STS pound zero, whereas the ultra CD5 group site or the modern team sites are going to be created with GRP pound zero, something similar to that. Right. So it's a different site template uh, under the covers. But on the surface, from a user perspective, I can I can bring in that legacy feel uh, within these um, within this legacy uh, that modern site feel within these legacy sites. So let's do this. So let me go to site content. Yeah, let's see. Uh, is it site assets? No. Let's go back. It's not. So it's under site pages, and I call this guy um, this one here the gibberish right so this is my page so now if I go back to this library what you can do is say well you might say Deshaun well that's nice but you know you were playing with the legacy site you did not uh, and they and though you were able to create a modern page when my users come um, how do I get them to see that page and Microsoft figured this thing out to where you know if you're in the legacy site and you want to make a modern page or home page right you just select this guy go to the uh, control panel here and then uh, select make home page and now when you click on home you're going to get uh, the modern page by default and now you can come here and interact with the modern web parts and the modern page and all this other good stuff but still have your document libraries your custom list and all this other good stuff that you migrated from your 07 and 2010 and 2007 site uh, 2013 Oh, 07 2013 and 2007 site so but yeah so I mean basically that's that's it I mean it, you know this is it's, I think that the biggest takeaway from this one is that especially when you're looking at a strategy just understand that Microsoft is is way more towards or leaning more towards the modern technology the modern design the modern UI pages that is going to be mobile friendly and cloud friendly out of the gate in order to to work on and customize within those pages the add-in model would not work right uh, you're only dealing with the SharePoint development framework as of right now 
Um, the plan is, and they already mentioned this uh, in, in several blog posts and conferences, that the modern uh, web parts will be backwards compatible, right? So you can not only can you use them backwards compatible in the sense that, yeah, okay, I can create a modern site page within the legacy site so I have access to those new modern web parts, but also on your, in your legacy page, um, I think it's home ASPX, even in this legacy page, right, if you go to edit and add a web part, now this is going to blow up because this blew up before, but you're going to have this under development, but uh, unfortunately they will start to create different web part gallery groups or folders uh, for these modern pages. And as you can see, news headlines and new l news lists is, start, is already baked in there, though I cannot use it yet. Uh, but eventually you will have that capability. So from a strategy standpoint, I would I would lean towards, uh, and then, you know, your users are different, right? Because there's a couple things to consider from a strategy standpoint. When you're looking at this UI, right, this is, is, is not, it's not horrible, meaning that, you know, any user who's familiar with SharePoint would eventually they would just start clicking around. They can figure this stuff out. So I don't think you have to go through like a major, major training exercise. But if you have like a lot of training material that was based on the old UI, you're going to end up scrapping, losing a lot of that because it's just different, right? There's no ribbon, especially if you come from, actually, if you come from either one of those three guys, right, 07, 2010, or 2013, there's no ribbon or any of that stuff that you will be able to leverage your old training material. So I think there's going to be some retraining either way. But but I think uh, this is definitely the way to go. Uh, and the good news is that, you know, even if you decide to go with this route, you know, later versus sooner, uh, you're not boxed in. And I think from an architecture standpoint, that's what you, you know, those are the two or three things that I look for. One, what which feature or capability is going to satisfy the majority of the business requirements. I understand there's going to be outliers and edge cases. Uh, number two, um, what are we going to do from a training perspective, right? How foreign is this going to look to an uh, end user? And then is there a flexibility that says, Okay, what if I have some groups that want to go modern and other groups that want to stay legacy because, you know, they have a, a much larger organization and to train 300 people with this new, you know, this new way of life may be more of a pain than, you know, a help than, you know, keep them on the legacy, right? But I think you have some flexibility there with, with, uh, with going out of the gate. Oh, here's the one thing. Here's the one last thing I wanted to show. So let me just, we'll just leave here. Uh, and then we're going to wrap this episode up. When, so this create site here, uh, this is controlled by, um, I want to say your SharePoint admin. Your SharePoint admin has the ability to hide or show uh, this create site for is the all or nothing f configuration, right? Uh, so if you hide it, it's going to be hidden for everyone. If you show it, it's going to be available for everyone. Um, but right now, as you can see with this URL, and I think this is kind of hard to tell, but... Uh, when I create a site here, let me just do a test uh, self-service. This is going to create a legacy site. This is going to create a legacy site under my root site collection. Now, your SharePoint admin will have the capability to change which site collection all of these self-service subsites get created in. And these only get created in the, uh, when they are created, they create in the first level. Uh, so this is an example of the site here. And um, these are created by default using the team site template, right? The legacy team site template. But, you know, once this guy is created, now I can go in here and hit add page. And then actually go in, uh, start using that new modern design or modern site template. Now that's how it is today, and this is going to, and this is changing actually pretty quickly. I expect that you know when we go, because what the future holds is that when you go back to that create site, what it's going to do is create you a new modern team site. And once you create that modern team site, you're going to be able to, it's going to treat you like, like an O365 group, right, where you have to select the name, the description, the privacy setting. But they're also going to add in the classification. And within that classification, that's when you're, if you're going to like data loss prevention or you know, information security, where you want to classify not only your, your documents, but also your sites as far as like confidential or, you know, urgent or, you know, extreme secret or whatever, you know, 
uh, naming conventions or data classifications you guys have there in, within your organization, you will be able to leverage those. And those are fully custom, right? You can customize that. It's a drop down. Uh, so you can customize that drop down. And then based on how you classify that document, then you can start using the Compliance Center and some of these newer features that Microsoft is rolling on O365 to where it says, oh, if this site is classified as super secret, then do not allow them to external share. Or if you have documents in the site that's classified as super secret, then, you know, they will not be able to do X, right? Or they, you know, you have to encrypt that at rest, meaning that if that, if that document does, however, it gets emailed out to, you know, Joe Blow at yahoo.com, when they click on the link, it's going to be encrypted because, you know, they would have to get an encryption query, have it decrypted, and all this other good stuff. So you can set up those different types of policies, policies in the future, um, and that's where they're kind of going with that. And But they're priming those new site creations with that capability, which is actually uh, pretty nice. So, you know, so I think from a strategy standpoint, just be aware of the changes and just be aware of the different development models that are required when you want to customize based on if you're in the modern site in design or the legacy site in design where it seems like because the modern web parts are backwards compatible but the add-ins are not forwards compatible it would make sense to really start to shift gears and have your dev team focus on the new modern technology and capability all right so any questions I, I i know this was a lot but you know feel free to use the comment section uh, I'm not sure if this is going to find its way on YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn, but, you know, use the comment section. Uh, feel free to send me an email at info at softnet. I, info at softnet. I'll put this up here. Shoot me an email here if you have any questions. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I know there's a ton of information uh, that was just thrown. Uh, I think, and I think with, when it comes to modern sites and all this other good stuff, this is the moving target. And I think this is what makes the strategy a little bit tricky. But, you know, if you plan for the future versus planning for the now, I think you would be okay. But I think if you start to plan, play, you know, plan on what you've been doing and ignore the future with the understanding that this environment is changing beyond your control, right? It's not like, it's like oh, no, they're coming out with modern team sites. We're not going to do that now. Right, you're going to get that capability. If they give you the switch to turn it off in the tenant admin or SharePoint admin, that's one thing. But even that's going to be a temporary solution, maybe six months, eight months at best, before you kind of force down that road. Um, so you know, you just don't want to find yourself in that mixed bag and slow the organization down because you know we didn't make a a proper decision now and versus reacting to you know what the business requirements are you know later so you know just one of those things to keep in mind all right so i catch you in the next episode I actually um i kind of forgot what what we're doing in the next episode but i'll catch you in the next episode and um and then we'll talk then all right take care